All right. Am I okay? Can y'all hear me? Okay. Uh, this is a, a, I wanted to start a sermon series today. Uh, we're going to be preaching through the little book of Habakkuk. And uh, if you don't know where that is in your Bible, then in the front of your Bible there's an index. Uh, look under H, <laughs> Habakkuk. That's the best way to find it. But the title of the series is Trusting God When You Don't Understand Him. Brenda and Mary have a song, I think, that will help us with that. In Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What better time than now in the world we live in to trust and proclaim that our God is able to handle our concerns for today and for tomorrow and for all generations to come. God can handle it. He's in control. He is able. Brenda and Mary. This is part one of the first message. The first message has two parts. You'll get the second part next week. When God 
doesn't make sense. It was uh, 39 years ago, but I still remember it very well. May 27th, 1981. The call came at about 10.30 p.m. Someone had died. Would I please call the family? And before I could pick up the phone, the mother called me. Her daughter, Sheila Couples, had been brutally raped and murdered on the night of her high school graduation. Sheila had been in one of my classes at Chester County High School in Henderson, Tennessee, so I knew her quite well. And as I got dressed to go to the home, I wondered what I would say. When I arrived, it was quite crowded. Everyone was kind of milling around in a state of confusion. And at length, the mother took me aside and through her tears, she asked me the question that I had known was coming. Why? Why did God let this happen to my daughter? And it wasn't the first time that I really had no satisfactory answer to that question. And I was sure then, as I am even now, that it wouldn't be the last. When you look at the questions of life and death and when you consider the problems of this death sentence generation, even the most fervent believer looks up to the heavens and, and cries out, why? Why me? Why now? Why this? It's an amazing thing. Why? The question rings across the centuries and through every generation, all of us ask that question sooner or later. If you haven't went yet, if you haven't asked that yet, you will. It's a question that uh, it doesn't admit an easy answer. Indeed, the godliest believers have sometimes wondered about the ways of God. And if Job never got a complete answer, what can I expect? As I read the Bible, I don't think there is one single answer. We get one kind of answer in the book of Genesis. We get another kind of answer in Job. Still other answers in the book of Psalms. Ecclesiastes takes a, another different approach. And then the Gospels present us with a Christ whose very coming alters the way we think about everything. And then finally, the book of Revelation shows us our Lord's final victory and the final defeat of evil. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't mean to suggest that these various perspectives contradict each other. It's just that the problem of human suffering is so vast that we need a number of different ways to think about it. And that's where the book of Habakkuk comes in. So go with me now. If you have your Bibles, you can try to find Habakkuk. If not, I've put it up on the screen. We're going to just be reading, looking at the first 11 verses of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I got to see if I can manage this little thing with my Bible in my hand, too. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. This first part is, that's just a little introductory sentence in verse 1. Beginning in verse 2, you have Habakkuk's complaint How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice 
is perverted. Habakkuk's question. Now, verse 5, the Lord's answer. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities by building earthen ramps. They capture them. And then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. Wow. Wow. Habakkuk had a complaint, and God answered. In this series, we're going to dig a little deeper into this little book, written just before the world caved in for the people of Judah. Now, like I said earlier, if you don't know where to find Habakkuk, it's easy. Look in the minor prophets of the Old Testament, and Habakkuk is squeezed in between Nahum and Zephaniah. Those two books that we just read all the time, right? Uh, <laughs> I suggest still that you just uh, look at the index. Let's back up for just a second. There are 17 prophetic books in the Old Testament, divided between the major prophets, five books, and the minor prophets, 12 books. They're not called major and minor because of their respective importance, but because of their size. In one of my Bibles I have at home, the five major prophets take up 191 pages, while the 12 minor prophets take up only 61 pages. We're talking about short books here. Habakkuk itself contains 56 verses spread over three chapters. And though he is a minor prophet, there's nothing minor about his message at all. He's writing about a topic that we all think about eventually. Habakkuk is really unlike the other prophetic books in that it records a dialogue between one man and God. Whereas Isaiah contains a message from God, Habakkuk records a conversation with God. If you've ever felt like you had a few questions for God, <clears throat> now then this is the book for you because there's a conversation here. Professor Howard Hendricks from Dallas Seminary said that Habakkuk was, quote, the man with a question mark for a brain, unquote. <laughs> Here's a bit of the background of this, of this book. We think or the scholars think, that the year is about 605 B.C. or somewhere thereabouts. We can't be sure of the precise year, but that's a good guess. After good King Josiah died in 609 B.C., the nation of Judah plunged headlong back into the cesspool of corruption, immorality, and idolatry that had plagued it for many generations. This time, the people seemed hell-bent on their own destruction. And instead of edging toward the cliff a little bit at a time, they seemed determined to just plunge over it going full speed. It was as if the nation had a death wish and no use for God at all. And then Habakkuk arrives on the scene. Now, about that man, about the man Habakkuk, we know almost nothing. We assume he was around 30 years old. That's just a guess. We know he was a contemporary of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, 
and would have been probably 10 to 15 years older than Daniel. When he saw the terrible moral decline of Judah, he prayed for God to do something. In his mind, he no doubt thought that God would raise up another king, another good king like Josiah, to lead the people in the right direction. <laughs> Little did he know that God's answer would come by way of the hated Babylonians. As I consider the situation behind the book, I'm reminded of the famous words of Billy Graham <clears throat> uttered when he was a young preacher when he said, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. If those words were true 60 years ago, how much truer are they today? Habakkuk lived in confusing times, and <clears throat> so do we. Habakkuk had a hard time understanding God. So do we. And that's why I'm calling this series, Trusting God When You Don't Understand Him. We need to sit with Habakkuk for a while so we can find a faith strong enough for our own troubling times. Habakkuk wrote out his argument with God in three short chapters. Let me give you just a simple outline. Chapter 1, faith tested. Chapter 2, faith taught. Chapter 3, faith triumphant. We could describe his personal journey <clears throat> this way. Chapter 1, argument. Chapter 2, answer. Chapter 3, acceptance. And then here's what Habakkuk is doing in each chapter. Chapter 1, asking. Chapter 2, waiting. Chapter 3, praying. And along the way, when all this is going on and Habakkuk is recording all of this, he experiences a total change. In this book, he moves from fear to faith, from burden to blessing, from perplexity to praise, from confusion to confidence, from worry to worship. Dr. J. Vernon McGee says that Habakkuk <coughs> begins with a question mark and ends with an exclamation point. In many ways, this is a very modern book, and in it, there are questions that raise that we wrestle with even today. Why is God silent? Why doesn't he act? Where is my Lord? Go back to that question again. Where is God when we need him? And I'm sure we've all been there. Even if we wouldn't put it exactly that way, when up against a problem for which there seems to be no human solution, we look to heaven and cry, God, why don't you do something? Why don't you move? Why don't you act? We've all seen tragedy that has affected our lives as well as people around us. And we wonder, why do those things happen? Next week, in part two, we're going to begin to look a little deeper into that answer that God gives. And I, I feel, I really feel a kinship with Habakkuk at asking the questions that he asked. Because it was just one of those situations when he really couldn't understand what was happening. And as we look around us today, and we see hundreds of thousands of people who have lost their lives to the coronavirus. And we see nations that are struggling even to stay afloat and keep their, their society going because of this dreaded virus. We look around us and we say, God, why? Why is this happening? And next week we'll begin to look deeper into the answer that God gives us. And I pray that it would be an answer that we all can handle. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father, we thank you again for the privilege we have to worship you together. We thank you for each one here. We thank you for your blessings. And we pray, God, that you would help us to receive your answer on why things happen that we don't understand. Lord, sometimes you really don't make sense. And we understand that it's because you're God and we're not. So we don't understand your processes and your thinking. So God, help us. Help us in this little book of Habakkuk to learn more about how to receive from you, how to deal with your answers. Give us strength. Give us courage. Give us peace and understanding as we search the scriptures today. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing hymn. It's great as our faithfulness. If you're here today and there's a decision that you need to make, please don't hesitate to come and share that with us.